Thanks. Are we ready to, for some pair programming or mob programming? Yeah. Okay, I hope yeah, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have with me Melody, who is uh, going to be pairing with me uh, later for the demo, so that uh, hopefully you can learn something about uh, pair programming. Um, so I'll just go quickly into. <laughs> ooh, I'm gonna, I hope you're right. So, you oh, okay. Hey. Okay, cool. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'll just go right straight to it. So what is programming? Pair programming. Pair programming is a agile software development technique in which two programmers uh, work together on code in one workstation. Basically, you're sitting together side by side and working on some code together. And usually it's just one computer with two sets of keyboard and mouse and, and, and in some cases even two monitors. So you can sit side by side uh, opposite each other. Uh, in one of my previous companies, they actually custom made a, a IKEA table where they cut, cut into Z shape and then two, put two IMAX and then you see each other next side by side. It's quite, it was quite unique. Uh. It was so unique that every time we have recruitment or work or a conference, right, we'll bring that on the table there to show people, hey, we do pair programming, this is a cool way to do it again. So, yeah, it's a bit of a flex. Uh. But there are also different styles of pair, pair programming. So, the, so different styles that are the two styles that I will, will describe here. One is a driver navigator. One where, where by one one writes the code with hands on the keyboard, the driver, and then we have the navigator who is kind of like the who is more familiar with the business domain and basically tell you oh you should do this do that uh, move to this file open this file go to line sixteen do something there something like that so there's a, navig a navigator who who basically be also thinking and going through as the person on uh, with, the, uh, with the driver will be using the keyboard uh. but it's usually the person with the mo most uh, uh, knowledge of all the shortcut keys can use with the driver uh. And the other style is ping pong. Ping pong style is basically one person will write the test, and then the one the other person will write the, the code, production code, right? So basically, what we write the failing test, but basically the because we in TDD when we first write the test without the production code, you fail, right? So there's the failing test, and the other person will make the test pass, right? So this is the ping pong style. Later on, during the demo, we'll be trying the ping pong style with Melody. And here's what it looks like uh, in one of my companies I worked at before. This is actually our actual actual, um, uh, actual set, uh, setup. We actually had dedicated tables where they can do pair, pair programming. So basically, it's like uh, two two sets of keyboard and mouse. One usually there's one large monitor. You have like you look at code together, uh, or you can have two monitors side by side, right? So they could be something you can use. Uh. And you think side by side, you communicate uh, using verbal verbal cues like, oh, look at line number sixteen. Or you use your mouse to kind of like shake, shake, shake a bit to say, oh, this is what I'm looking at, right? Rather than you point the screen. So the problem with having two screens is I point my screen, he don't know where I'm pointing. The other person is looking at his screen, he don't know where, where, is, where I'm pointing, right? So that's why visual cues, audio cues are very important for pair programming. Here's some other styles you will sit really close to each other. So sometimes breath means are important. <laughs> yeah. And uh, make sure you don't have any like uh, smelly food. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so some of the benefits of uh, pair programming, right? Let's go through a little bit of those. First of all, if you are joining a new company, like almost every company I joined in uh, my first few weeks, first week, I'll just be pair programming with somebody. Like one, one uh, startup that I joined right, uh, in, in, in my younger days, I basically grabbed my colleague there, hey, can I just pair with you for a few days? You show me how this code works, how the, what's the setup technique for the whole thing. Uh, tell me how you, how you guys do the, uh, Code check in, you know what's the what's the what's the working pattern? Uh? So that's a very good way to kind of like um, getting knowledge dump from your colleague by just looking at them, looking at them, and sh and looking at how they do 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 uh, do the uh, work they do, uh, right? So instead of them, you talk to them, you also go through, uh, you also get really good uh, knowledge about the workflow, coding conventions, uh, things like the practices and the teams, uh, how they do uh, code push, uh, and who should do code review and stuff like that, right? Uh, and second thing is knowledge sharing. So you learn a lot from just discussing about the code. So as you're writing the code, you're talking about the code. Oh, so should this be this function? What's the name of this function? Should we call it foo? Should we call it bar? Should we call it calculate calculate my uh, my salary or kind of, kind of thing, right? So so yeah. So you can talk have a discussion about code. What what's good? What's what's bad? What what is what is what makes sense? What doesn't make sense, right? So just talking to a person uh, who you're coding with actually helps. And we do rotate pair rotation. We rotate pairs within the different uh, 
uh, pairs in, in the company, in your team. It helps also to share knowledge. Like say, uh, me and my colleague worked on function A or this part of the part of the system. Then okay, I rotate out and I work with another person. Then he also know more about the system I worked on previously, right? So it's a good way of get, getting knowledge shared across the team and not have like knowledge silos where one person or two person, only two person know about this system, right? I think, I think some of us be familiar with that, uh, that problem. Mm. And also third, third, uh, third, third uh, benefit is, is like, um, so pair programming is part of one of the practices that they talk about in extreme programming. So the extreme, in extreme programming, they talk about what is a good practice and break down it all the way to the extreme. 110%, what does it look like? So if you believe code review is a good practice to have as software engineers, dialing it to the extreme end, what does it look like? Extreme code review, certain person sitting next to you, looking at the code and giving you comments and tell you what, what's the best way to do this, right? So this extreme code review. So this is basically, uh, basically uh, you can help you catch typos much faster. You can help you figure out that you're, you're using wrong syntax and stuff like that. So next thing is uh, reduces cognitive load. Basically, you can then focus, say, if you're doing a ping pong, ping pong style, you can just focus on the coding or you focus on the testing. Then you don't have to think too much about other things, right? It also reduces the strain of context switching. So for example, if I'm, in a, I'm working with a pair and then I get called away to work uh, on something else or take a phone call or I talk to somebody for, or, or about some other matters, they come back, the other person is still in the flow, right? And because the other person is still in the flow, can, I can get back into the flow very quickly. So that the, the cost of context switching is much uh, cheaper, right? Rather than I work on code, I get disrupted. Then I, after I got disrupted, I come back, I got to spend another two hours to try and get back into the coding uh, momentum, right? So yeah, so uh, having a pair helps you uh, getting back into the flow uh, much easily. It also encourages collective code ownership. So everyone in the team now has more than one person now knows about the, the code, knows about what's going on, right? So collective code ownership abandons any notion of individual ownership of the module. So each module is now owned by the entire team. Anyone can make changes anywhere. So basically anyone who has had review on that particular piece can now also uh, work on, the, on that piece, right? So you also increase, you also does what we call increase the bus factor. Any, any, are you familiar with the bus factor or truck factor? How many contributes? <laughs> the, the bus factor means how many people in your company have been hit down by a bus before the <laughs> business is cannot, cannot continue, right? So, mm. so, so, so think of it as having more people know, know about the code means uh, I can go on a holiday and not have to worry about, oh, you call me if, I'm the, if there's a production issue. <sighs> Trauma. <laughs> okay. So, um, so before we go any further, I'll just do a quick demo with Melody and we'll, de we'll demonstrate uh, how we would do pair programming. So you can, uh, you can observe, we have two keyboards and actually only one mouse, but I think you can share. Um, so we're trying to, that's Melody, and uh, we'll, we'll do this. Is that the camera? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so um, this is a code that we'll try to do. It's a, it's a code kata called the Mars Rover kata. So the task is to basically uh, explore Mars, and we will I think of some software that will help us uh, uh, move the Mars rover on the on the Mars on the surface of Mars, uh, right? So we I, we, we I cancel out some of the requirements because I think there's too much to deal with in a very short time. So uh, it's very simple. You're given an initial starting point x and y, uh, and then uh, of the rover and the direction north, south, east, west that is facing. The rover can uh, will receive characters that will tell it what to do. So you can either move forward or backwards or turn 90, 90 degrees left or right, right? So it's very simple. Uh, and of course, the other requirements would be going around the grid and make sure you don't fall off the edge of the, of the grid. But that's uh, out of scope for today. But basically, what, how will you do this, right? So in pair programming, usually what we do is, first thing you want to do is plan. So Melody, how do you think, how do you think we should approach this? Yeah, so the thing is, initially, we are on, so so let me just clarify um, what the task is first. So um, basically, we, we have a grid, and let's say the robot is starting at um, coordinate 1, 2, mm -hmm. and you're supposed to move to a certain edge, and it is forward and backwards. So let's say if we want to move to a certain coordinate, must we turn the robot first and move to that 
coordinate or um must we can we like okay um go straight to the coordinate yeah. i think you have to turn first before you go to the coordinate so it's like if it's here you got to turn okay. and it's facing north we got to turn right before you can go right you can't, you can't just go straight while facing front go right so you have to turn it first before you turn right before you can move right rather okay okay sure. so this is a simple uh, graph that we i've come up with to kind of like visualize this because you know i'm a very visual person so this is also helpful for melody and myself that think about this so let's say we have a vehicle maybe we started off at a certain point in the grid say uh two two three maybe around here mm. right then we start off here then we make it face north oops sorry let me see yeah yeah so make it face north right and then from there that could be our starting point right so it'll be x3 uh and y2 okay and uh so what we'll do right now will be uh going to the code editor and we'll do ping pong style are we okay with that yeah all right perfect. so i will now write the test and then she can uh work on the code uh so first of all i'll move this around because you know in the one thing about pair programming is that you want to set up your environment with a nice way that you can really be, become very efficient okay mm, my. Oh, sorry <laughs> sorry sips, sips. okay so uh we'll, we'll first try with writing a test um mike but before you write the test shall we do a class-based um ro rover that is um moving around first yeah so yeah let's do that so yeah. Let's change this to a class. So instead of a rover, we've got a class and a rover and the empty rover. And so that's the first one. And then we'll we import a rover. All right. Yep. And then we write the um the test cases that we want to first. Sure. Let's start with it will go. Is it okay if I, if I just shout like this? Okay. So <laughs> Okay, so uh, first thing we do is make this rover, we initialize a rover, right? We initialize a rover and basically we, uh, we give it a constant, we call it rover and new rover, right? And then uh, the rover should have some coordinates and stuff. So maybe what I can do is I can pass in an option, right? Mm -hmm. Option what do you what it was a requirement about? We have a starting point. Yeah, we have yeah. a starting point. Okay. And we have an initial direction that um the bot is facing. Yeah, so let's say the two, three, that's where we where we're going with, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have the direction, right? Okay. So direction would be in this case would be north, right? Yep. So this will be the, the initialization. Uh, we pass it in here, right? So assume so what what we're doing now is just designing the interface. We haven't even read a single lab code. So you were at my uh, talk last last month about TDD. This is pretty much it. A design before I actually actually write the damn thing. Okay, so we have the rover now, and maybe to verify where does it where is where it, it is facing, perhaps okay, we will basically do the verification to, by asking it rover dot direction, right? Yep. Uh, it should probably be north. Yep. Yeah. So I can write the first test. Let's see how it goes. And it should fail. And it should fail. As yeah. you can see, it's failing. And it's failing for a certain reason. What's the reason here? The rover is not a constructor. There's no constructor here. So, so we should pong. write constructor. <laughs> okay, let's have right? that. And the constructor should have um this dot um what's the direction? Direction. Yeah. Direction. Let's try and make it pass first. And we put it as north. So I'll okay. save it. Hey, what? Come on, save. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she's using a, a Windows keyboard. Okay, it's passing. Yes. So you can see this. Uh, she's hard coding stuff. So I should we should probably try and break the hard code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's try and do something else. Maybe we should check also its current current uh, current uh, position. Right. Current position should, because we're passing in two three. We want to map map it to x equals to two, y equals to three. Let's do this. All right, it's failing. Okay, yeah, then so returning okay. undefined. Okay, what do we do? So we go back and then this dot okay, dot current position yep. would be equivalent to x and two 
and mm. Y and three. Sorry, this is just dumb okay, hard fine. coding first. Fine, we can do this. Yes, let's... by right it's supposed. Okay. Oops. All right, let's save it. It's passing. Great. So in the, in TDD, we also talk about red. We've got it red. We've got it green, and now the refactoring phase. So what what would you like to refactor, Melody? So the thing is, we should have taken in a current position, yep. aka the option, and that goes along here. Right? Okay. Right. Option. So option. Oh, right. Yep. And basically, this dot direction should be option. Option dot direction. Yeah. Option dot um direction. Okay. And wait. and this one should be ah gone wrong. Okay. Okay. Um, this one, one should be x of um this uh, option option yeah option dot dot uh, was it called initial no 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 uh, oh yeah starting point I think starting, starting point, point. Right? yeah okay starting point yeah so if this was a uh, TypeScript we probably would have uh. <laughs> I'm yeah, we're doing JavaScript today, so yeah. TypeScript, I will be writing the types. Yep. Starting point. Starting and point. We and have uh, second one. option. Yeah. Okay, okay. let's mm. make it nicer for people to see. You save like auto linter. La. Save, save, save. <laughs> Just press save. It's my save. No? Okay, now my okay, yes. okay, let's see. Looks like it's, it's, it's uh, still passing. Yeah, the reason is because we didn't change the behavior, right? So, uh, uh, so that therefore the test is going to pass. Great. So we we've started the we initialize the rover. Maybe what we do next is let's make the rover turn. So what I go do is I'll just copy this whole chunk first because I I'm, I want to just uh, make sure I get the rover moving. So we make a turn left, right. We will use the same rover, and from the rover maybe we'll do something like say rover dot turn left, right, and then. After that, the direction should then be changed to facing from north to left. It should be facing west, right? Yeah. Okay, let's try that. You fail. Yeah. You fail, and it's really for the right reason, I hope. Because yeah, because there's no um, ah, no turn method. left. Okay, yeah. there's no turn left. Okay. So what do you do then? No, 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 no. You're supposed to go to the okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the turn left yep. function, turn left function is supposed to um. So for turn left, we are imagining turning in ninety degrees to yeah. left. So you can try you and hard code this first. Yep. You've been hard coding it all this while. So so, <laughs> so let's try <laughs> a turn left map. Yeah. Um would oh, be okay. yeah. yeah. Fine, you so, can try this. <laughs> he knows what she's doing. So okay. um north if I turn left naughty elephants quick water. So that would be <laughs> <laughs> west okay um if i go from the south, south. i would move to the you turn left you'll be turning the to the east, east. right east, correct. Yeah. um and if i turn from the west west turning left will be to the south okay so west yeah, yeah. there will be yeah south, south. yeah you don't trust me huh? <laughs> <laughs> i trust you <laughs> Okay. Um. Yeah. Let's let's keep it to capital letters for consistency. Okay. Um. From east east and then turn north. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because Good. it's so like a bunch opposite. of maps. So what do you do then? Right. So the thing is, um, your this dot yep. direction. direction. Yep. Yeah. This dot current position. No, no, no. no. This direction. dot yeah direction. direction. Yep. Of um will be changed to it will be like this right it will be, it will be direct, a, direction direction yeah. yeah will be the turn left yeah yeah so turn left map mm -hmm. and you want to change it to this dot direction so it moves on the current direction to the next direction yeah. when it turns left okay let's let's save it yeah and it passes great okay. i think you jump ahead of us uh. we were supposed to do the other do the other direction right so if i turn so let's just do this properly i do that turn left what so from here my position is the west so if i turn left from the west it will get me to the south south yep yep right let's save and it should pass i hope okay so that means your, your implementation is correct so let's take another one you turn again where will we go to 
So uh, south, south, turn left, east. you be east. Yeah. Okay, let's save it. Okay, it's passing. Okay, good. <laughs> and from the east, if I turn left again, where will we go? East, if I turn left, there will be north. north. Okay, yeah. let's go. All right, cool. Yeah, uh, refactor. yeah, then now we can, what can we refactor? Hmm, good question. Maybe what do you we want should to, ask the floor. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think we, should, we could refactor, guys? Huh? Move? That's, uh, that's more like next implementation. Refactoring is about looking at the code, seeing like what are the repetitions or things that we can do better to improve the, to improve the readability of the code. Refactor implementation. What can we refactor? What do you think? Actually, test code is also something you want to refactor, right? So what we could do is maybe in most tests, in most unit tests, there's a before each. Yeah. As a, as a setup. We could actually initialize the object. Yeah, we initialize the object, so we, we can share the same object. Yeah, so we can share the same object. So rover will just be something we want to use, and and this will basically be something you can copy from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's move that up. And now uh, Rover is not, not a const, but it's because using the let. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep doing that. Yep. It will save. Does it pass? Yes. It does. So it works. So maybe what I can do is I can also remove this one and see whether it still works. It does. Yes. All right, high five. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Right, so that's a quick demo of, of pair programming between uh, uh, Melody and myself. So what do you observe from the session just now? Any thoughts? What have you observed from our pair programming session? Sounds quite fun. Yeah, it is. It's gonna be like a game, right? So it's always like a ping pong, right? Like, you know, like, I, I write a test and then you must make it pass, kind of thing. So thou shall not pass. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, it gamifies the experience. This is true. It's quite fun. Any other thoughts or observations? Sorry? Is it easier to rubber duck when this actual person talking back to you, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 thought as well. Very supportive one another. Yeah, it's very encouraging. We, we help each other to kind of like, oh, I think you got the right path. You're on the right path. We made this mistake. I'll fix that for you, kind of thing. So yeah, it's help, very helpful. If you're supporting person, then you free the person up to think and focus about on the implementation. Yeah. So to implement the whole yeah, you focus on the most immediate thing you need to fix or you build first, right? So basically the minimum, the baby steps. In TDD, in my workshop last, uh, my, my, my talk last month, I talked about baby steps. So you take baby steps to move those. And because of pairing on this, we can, I can, we can work on a small incremental uh, changes to make the, make the code work. So I'll, we went as far as hard coding things first, and then we go back and refactor because we have a test that could kind of like cover us for any behaviors. Uh, what if we made any changes that cause any uh, behavioral change, like uh, reducing some bug, right? Any other observations? Yes. I think, yeah, um, Jing Shen, to answer your question, right? Um, if you observe just now, we aren't fighting over like um the keyboard. Maybe like you know, I'll be like, hmm, uh, Mike, is this something? Is this the correct syntax or something like that, right? I, I think th that there was more of the collaborative aspect where we kind of let each other have the way, like, you know, more yeah. the shall we mm, do this or something. It's more of a discursive um, kind of platform. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, when, when I excluded, you're like uh, in sync, right? But what if those two people are decided, how do you call plus one? Yeah, if it's a. It could be seniority, yeah. it could be more of like figure out what is, we just try one way and then we focus on that first, see how that works. If it doesn't work out, then we can backtrack. Up. So one of, the, one of the things that we didn't talk about is, uh, one of the other benefits I've learned in pair programming is you can prevent the other person from going down a rabbit hole. Yeah. You ever, ever had like coding experience? I spent half a day trying to figure out something, hey, wait, I'm actually on the wrong path. Right? So having a person 
be like time check, uh, help you time check this. They can say, hey, actually we're spending like two two hours on this already. I don't think we are getting anywhere. Should we try a different tactic? Right. So sometimes it's helpful. Have the other person be be kind of like along with you for the ride and say and observing and giving you feedback and tell, even telling you, I think we've gone too far down this rabbit hole. Let's get 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 out of it. So that's one of the hidden benefits of doing pair programming. But I think in terms of seniority or that answer, right? Because earlier I was um pair programming my junior just before I came to this meeting. <laughs> Because she, cause she was running um, something like a yarn test and she was like, why is this thing not running? And I'm like, okay, you've been stuck there for two hours. Shall we hop on a call? And then that's when I say, okay, um, you know, like, what have you done? Or, you know, um, maybe maybe let's um, trace back some steps that you can perhaps do. And then I say, okay, perhaps if I, I were you, I will consider this... Um, Different, different approach of uh, not committing. So what I can tell you to do is perhaps like, you know, backtrack your commit and then like, yeah. you know, delete your code. Then she was like, huh, why delete my code? And then I was like, I said, but you have committed the code and you have already pushed it. But I said, there's no harm resetting because you want to run on something that is seemingly working first, right? Yeah. And then you run it on your code and that's when you actually get it running. I said, Mm -hmm. You want to try this first? Yeah. And you were like, yeah, let's try it. It's almost 6 p.m. Yeah. And, and yeah, it just worked today. Yeah. So, so those are like one of the hidden fast benefits that you could cut down a sizable two hours into less than a 10-minute session. Yeah. yeah. Something I really do just now was to commit our code. Uh. So what we could have done is after, after every passing test, we can make a code commit and then see how that works. Mm -hmm. like. yeah. Any other observations or interest or thoughts? On the back, yeah. Yes, communication is very important. Just like uh, it's almost as much question as there is coding. Yeah, so it's kind of like when you when we write code ourselves, sometimes it's an internal monologue going yeah. on. You talk to Robert Duck TV, you know. So it's, so having a person actually talk to you is is actually very uh, uh, refreshing because then you can see different perspectives. I, I would have expected myself working in a certain direction and the other pair would have, oh no, actually this is a different thing. Like when I first did uh, this uh, kata on my, on my own, I never thought about using a, a turn, turn, turning map. I was like, let's make a, a switch case, if else statement, da, da, da. Just get it to work first. For my, my case, is get it to work first. So when I pair it first, she, like, immediately first thing she, she observed and, and noticed was, let's get a map there and you know, get this thing working. Right? So in, in a way, she's gone two steps ahead, ahead of me. Uh, which you have done, if we are we're in a pairing, uh, pairing situation on an actual production code, we have accelerated our production deployment, or rather our, our ability to build this feature. Rather than me, I'll, I'll take, I'll take us out, me, micro steps, mini steps, get to get the thing. She saw three steps ahead of me. So it's, for me, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. Yes, Zach. So, um, do you have different, there are different styles of pair programming. I guess it's uh, depends on the of the pair. If mm. the pairing experience like uh I, I if I pair with someone, I'll usually do the ping pong style because I I feel I'm stronger with writing tests. The other person maybe not as strong as writing tests. So I'll use that as a as a way of teaching them uh this is how you write a unit test, and this is how you do a unit test. And if you're pairing with someone who's more senior, I might want, or I, I might say, if I join a company and, and I'm totally new to the source code, uh, I will yeah. find a, a more senior person and I'll be the driver navigator. And you tell me what to do, and I'll just, I'll just follow you to you, telling me what to do. And from that, I will just build the muscle memory in my hands, how I should navigate the source code and, and all that stuff. Right? So it depends on the situation, it depends on the kind of work you're trying to build. Right? Okay, so uh, I'll just go straight more into three slides of practical tips. First of all, be conversational. You can tell that just now, well, between Melody and myself, myself, we're just constantly talking, 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 talking about the code, right? So talk through your thought process because people can't read your mind. So please talk talk about it. Uh, secondly, is plan. So we spend about a few uh, few seconds, <laughs> half a minute, planning about what do you think. Uh, and she was clarifying some requirements from there. Then it's, it's good as well. Sometimes when you do, Start like user story at you in a pair, right? Sometimes I've seen, as, as especially in my workplace, uh, when we start a user story and the pair just picked it up and they talk to each other about, oh, I think, is this, is this really in scope? Is this not in scope? 
they realize, hey, actually we're missing some scope. Then they can just go straight to the business analyst and say, hey, actually we missed out this thing. Do you think we should include it? Is it in scope or, should we, or are you considering that piece as being another user story? So it's very fast to get clarify this because you're already talking to someone about, about the story. So, uh, and take notes. You find that sometimes it's faster to communicate on paper uh, or whiteboard than on, than on the screen. So basically you just draw something like what I showed you all. I have an Excel sheet or a Google sheet where I already have some form of like visualization. So it's helpful to kind of help to kind of communicate faster. Like. You can draw architecture diagram, bullet points, and stuff like that. Sometimes uh, we can break down a, a, a very big uh, user story into different tasks. And I've seen before, uh, I've tried this in one of my, uh, my previous company was uh, when we talk about what we want to do. Okay, let's right now on the whiteboard, five things we need to do today uh, to get this story done. Okay, we just do what we can, check out the first one, do what we can, check out the second one. So it's very helpful for us to visualize and work through things. I think in Agile, right, um, if I were to go back to the previous slide, right, about mm. taking notes and all that, right, writing your acceptance criteria is especially important because you're working in large teams. Like, um, just this week, I, I, I was just telling off my designer, like, do you want a full stop in this bullet point or you don't want a full stop? <laughs> Things like that. Do you want this to be in red color? Do you not want this to be red color? Like, all these minute little things, like, honestly, um, that's why Jira is there for you to like um document things down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um that that's the other part about taking notes other than communicating with your fellow engineers. Yeah. yeah. So uh next page is about agreeing on a pairing workflow. So uh, before you start the pair programming, maybe you want to check your pair. So how would you like to pair today? Oh, I'm feeling a bit tired. Maybe you could do the thinking and I'll do the typing. <laughs> or it could be the other way around, right? So it's about figuring out what is a pair that works for you and rotate and try different styles as you go along. Right. Well, the important thing here, here is collaboration. I'm collaborating mm -hmm. with somebody. We figure out what's a safe space and what's our comfort, comfort level, how much we want to talk today, and then we basically go, go through that. Lah. We focus on work at hand. So basically don't get distracted by work, uh, work emails, uh, social media pings. Don't waste the other person's time. Lah. So basically you're pairing with the person uh, you also want to make sure that their person, their, their, their time is also well spent in, in focus on the story, right? Um, also share keyboard time. So, so don't hold the keyboard, let the other person speak through the code as well and be patient with them. There's some people who, uh, I, when I uh, was pairing with Melody just now, she kept pressing the wrong key for a save, right? So I'll, I'll just help her. Lah. <laughs> um, uh, and sometimes it's, uh, you're really just not familiar with that uh, code syntax. So maybe it's about, Giving some them some time, figure out like when we when we start pairing, mm. uh, we did a practice run yesterday, and she wasn't familiar with the class syntax, and she had to do some googling. And okay, fine, you just Google, and I'll, I'll, but anyway, I'll just show you what it looks like and stuff like that. So it's being patient with the other person, being understanding, and then giving them time to it. Of course, you, with the, in the focus, in the spirit of not wasting other person's time, you also want to level up, right? So sometimes um, in some uh, projects I worked on, we we have very complicated keystrokes, uh, key key keyboard shortcuts, and we sometimes want to learn those keyboard shortcuts because we want to be as efficient as we can. Yeah. So and then we we have some software that we, that we can we, that basically broadcast the keystrokes I just press, so it's easier for the other pair to also learn this. Mm -hmm. So there's just some 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 interesting things you can do lah. So yes, uh, share keyboard time. Uh, use on screen cues to help the other bring focus. So basically, as I say, visual cues, uh, verbal cues. Bring them to that. Okay, look at this line, or use my mouse to jiggle a bit. That helps when, especially when you're pairing with the other person, uh, side by side, and their screen is not your screen. Um, next thing is take breaks. Pair programming is very tiring because your your mind is fully engaged. Unlike when you're doing uh, coding on your own, you like do a bit, check your Facebook, go back to coding, that kind of thing. So is you. Whereas you, you know, where your pair programming, especially at least by, by advice for anyone trying pair programming for the first time, uh, take it easy, right? And then, um, yeah, and rest. Rest is important. So take breaks. Sometimes when you reach a few unit tests, uh, you reach a good point. Uh, I finished one class already. I'm moving to the next. Before you move to the next uh, class or to, to work on, take a break. Take a five minutes break, bio break, whatever. And, and maybe it's helpful in some teams. Uh, work at. Um, we actually do have a ping pong table, so let's go play a ping pong come back before I get back to the, 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 the work, right? So yeah, so uh, you know, do get get check in, uh, get commit, um, and then um, take take a rest. 
because having a rested mind makes you think better, right? Uh, especially when you're like hitting a, a, a wall on some or some problem, taking a break is always always good, lah. And uh, rotate pairs so because as I say it helps spread the knowledge and best practices across the team, right? So that's important. So I'll, because right now we are in a post-pandemic era and people are working from home, I'll just share a little few, a couple of tools that you can use from uh, when you're in a hybrid or working from home kind of situation. Of course, you can use Zoom. I think uh, most of us already use that. And there's a screen sharing and remote control function in Zoom. So you can actually share your screen and let the person uh, control the stuff on your screen. Uh, VS Code Live Share. This is actually a very good plugin. Uh, this one doesn't have a uh, video. So basically just... Yeah. You just move the mouse around and just play around with it. You, so you will need to have some form of audio visual, like uh, video conferencing kind of thing to just talk to the other person. Like yesterday, we were, we were uh, playing around with a live, uh, live share. We were still on the Google Meet call. So we were on the Google Meet, we were doing a, vi a video, video, uh, video and audio. And then at the same time, I could show her some stuff on my screen. And then we go back to the VS Code for the coding. Mark. So yeah. Um, you can also use a software called Pop. Uh, Pop is actually quite nice, quite software you can get it to work. It actually has video, video screen, audio, and your screen sharing. And then when you're, when you're not actually using the keyboard or not actually typing on, on the keyboard, you can actually draw on, on the screen. So essentially, it's very, I find it very helpful when I'm comparing with somebody, he's I'm typing, 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 and then he, he will draw on this circle around this. Hey, I think you missed out this piece. You know, so it's helpful to help uh, bring focus on uh, for that. Uh, if you're on a cheap, you can, uh, oh, Pop is free, so you can play around with it. Uh, if on the cheap, you can try uh, Chrome Remote Desktop. It's also possible to do to remote pairing. If your company has money, you can get a, a real VNC. My company does use that. Uh, what I like about real VNC is that you can is is you don't need someone to be on the other side to turn on the screen sharing. It comes on uh, directly. And for the keyboard nerds who like to use uh, terminal and all that stuff, you can just there's this one called Teamit. So you we can use SSH, you open the SSH session and the other person can just lock in and yeah. <laughs> Shake it. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> anyway, um, so beyond pair programming, there's another concept called mock programming. What is mock programming? Mock programming is basically pair programming on steroids. <laughs> so basically you you have a whole bunch of folks, so you have a keyboard and uh, you still have only one computer, only have one keyboard, uh, you have maybe two sets of keyboards. But, and you also have a one who is a driver. So who is driver or, or who is the only person typing. And you have a, a few other people around you. So there are other, other developers on your team. Uh, then you'll be thinking about code together. There'll be DBAs, there'll be developers, there'll be QEs, there'll be like UX designers, product owners, everyone is sitting around you and talking about code. So that'll be the best experience. You work, you work that way. So yeah, so you essentially you have people around you who is like think tank. They have to think about the code, think about what we're doing. Is this function correct? Is this on on? Is it on? Is the design okay? Do we do we lift out a, a red colored dot somewhere? Yeah. So it's usually better you have big screen, so uh, like a large L L uh, TV or whatever. And then uh, one person will be controlling, and the rest just talk talk and you just go through like. Yeah. So these are some examples of how teams have done this uh, this one, and I would just share this very short video if I could. Oh no. You're not showing? <laughs> mob programming is what it sounds it's like. Cool. A small group or mob of developers working together in real time on one task on one computer. Mob programming takes advantage of a group's collective knowledge to complete a task, but also promotes the development of soft and hard skills. Mob programming has its roots in pair programming, a technique in which two developers work as a team on the same task using just one computer. Click the link above or in the description below to learn about the pros and cons of this technique. The defining characteristic of mob programming is developers grouped together at one workstation. There's no specific number of people that define a mob, but four to six is the norm. There's usually a large monitor or projector that ensures everyone on the team can see the code. The mob strategy uses a driver navigator workflow. Participants rotate through various roles, including the mob, 
are a small group that discusses alternative implementations and selecting the best course of action. The navigator, responsible for listening to the mob and communicating instructions to the driver. The driver, the only person behind the keyboard, responsible for converting the navigator's instructions into code. And the facilitator, responsible for keeping the mob on task and deciding when to switch rules. Mob programming brings benefits like continuous learning among the team, real-time code review to ensure coding standards are met, exposing and overcoming individual weaknesses, fast feedback from the mob, continuous work regardless if a member is unavailable, and hard and soft skill development. What other benefits have you reaped from mob programming? Share your thoughts below and be sure to hit that like button. Okay. Programmers get by. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's about mob programming. Uh, I find mob programming is interesting when you're like starting up a new project and everyone's like uncertain where to go. Like when, how do we, uh, what framework to use, what testing library we should have, what are validation libraries we should use kind of thing. And you just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page, like what, why we chose uh, framework A versus framework B. And I find it is helpful when my, my team was starting up with a, of a new, new uh, product, uh, uh, a new system we're building. And the first two, three, uh, first week we were just doing mock programming and we we're just going through different uh, frameworks of the things best. Let's, and everyone let's try and figure out how to build this uh, first page using this framework and, uh, and stuff like that. So it's like, it's helpful for to get everyone on the same page to just get things started, right? And in some teams, they've actually successfully used this in building features as well. So that's something to think about. So anyway, so that's that's all we have uh, for on pair programming and mock programming. Any questions and thoughts? No? Yes. More programming doesn't matter. Anyone, it can be any level. Yeah. Yes. I think uh, it depends. Uh, mm -hmm. um, like there's no far, hard and fast. In fact, yeah. when you first, you were 50 transitions to pair programming, uh, for the first few weeks, uh, you actually see a drop in your productivity because you are trying to figure out what is the right flow, you're trying to figure out what is the right pattern to use, what's the coding style that your your code your partner wants to use kind of thing so the first few weeks will basically be some there'll be some downtime i think it won't be that velocity won't be as high right but you read the benefit after maybe a month or a couple of weeks in uh, because then you have a shorthand about what you should how you should write code uh, have understanding within the team and when you start rotating pairs you also have learned about different parts of the system as well so if you keep an open mind and try it and then see you can see the benefit in the long run but whether any kind of product it works for, I don't know. I think it works in general. Lah. Yes, Zach. To add on to that, and you might go and write the talk as well, because uh, like, a lot of teams, when they're reluctant to have a product, they have a product, because it's not efficient. Like, one, you two developers will be the one. But one of the biggest arguments that I've heard of why you have a product is actually not, it's not to optimize for efficiency, it's to optimize for flow. Because what we want is that we want to move our feature from start to done as soon as possible. And a lot of time when we work individually on a feature, you don't need to wait for a code review, there will be delays yeah. in the chain, yeah. you need to contact yeah. switch. But when you have program, right, the other person could be together, you move from start to done faster. Just yeah. optimize it for flow so that you go to production and get back faster. So that's to reduce that in general. Mm -hmm. At least this is what I understood how what you think. I think code review is yes, you're right. Like in, in in flow, in getting the quick, fast flow, uh, and your code re code review in in real time, I think is helpful. And it's uh, sometimes it may also be so. In, in the teams I work in before, we do uh, with some parts of the team that does code review, and, and the part of the team that does um, 
pair programming, and then the moment they create a merge request, it's already reviewed by another person in real time, so they just approve it immediately. So, <laughs> which is actually quite quite interesting. Uh. So you you work, but um, I think pair rotation is also important to kind of get more people understanding what we're trying to do here. Right? So being intentional about rotating pairs, being intentional about uh, uh, switching pairs around. Of course, there is. There is some argument that says you shouldn't be rotating too rotating too often, because you rotate too often means you don't you don't have enough context on this on the yeah. code, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it, it depends on the team, uh, and just figure out what's what's comfortable for your team in terms of rotation pattern and the, how long it takes. Yeah, I think it's also dependent on um, team culture that's set. So, for example, in my team, we have a peer review first, like me and. Um, one other designated senior are paired to review this together, like um, to do a kickoff. And then after that, they are like, okay, let's get the whole lot of the team, you know, do a desk check. And, and that's when we say, hey, um, maybe, you know, like um, I flag out this error, you know, this link doesn't appear like that. And true enough, well, I got whacked today. <laughs> and then spending 10 minutes of my time to fix a correct code compared to in prod where your customers complete. Why the hell is the link not appearing? Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, like code review is <laughs> so we call uh, pair programming extreme code review. So basically, it's really someone looking at code uh, as you write it. And I've, I've saved so many from my uh, colleagues by fixing their typo. <laughs> you know, <laughs> saves time. Any other thoughts? Questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so um, that's it. I hope you can you try pair programming at your workplace and TDD as well. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes.